right, guys, welcome to Revive School. Here we are, lesson one, Acts one. You know, whenever you jump into the New Testament, and you go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then you get into the book of Acts. Like it, it's just, this is a fun, this is a fun book of the, of the Bible, but yeah, it's one of those that people are like, oh, I love the book of Acts. I love what God did in that time period. Can I just tell you, I hope and pray you see that God can do this today. I hope and pray that you see through the book of Acts that my God is so alive and real that through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, because He came back to life, you and I now have the Holy Spirit, and that's what we get to talk about in this book. We get to talk about the Spirit uh, coming alive in, guess what, in your life, in my life, because we get to learn how He does it through the apostles. You know, this book, Acts, so many people have different titles for this. The Acts of the Apostles, yes, absolutely it is. The Acts of the Holy Spirit, yes, absolutely it is. And here's what it all comes down to. All of that happens because Jesus gave the authorities to do this. The apostles can, and I love Mindy's painting, the apostles can walk out what they've been empowered to do because Jesus gave them the authority. Now think about this. You know, in the Gospels, remember, we always give one, one title, right? One, one uh, phrase to the Messiah in each book of the Bible. So in Matthew, you have king. You know, in Mark, uh, you said uh, you have servant. In Luke, you have son of man. And then in uh, John, you have the Son of God. What's interesting is, you know, Mindy's painting, uh, here you have the Gospel of Luke, and then here you have the, the book of Acts. It has that same white cloth, you know, that same look, that same feel. So everything that's happened here, Jesus says, now I want you to go do what I've just told you to do. In fact, if you go to Matthew 28, Kevin, verse 18, Jesus is describing to the apostles, he's describing to the disciples, hey, by the way, this is the game plan. <laughs> then Jesus came near and he said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So Jesus's authority is not limited. His authority is not just limited as a son of man. No, it's, it's through the son of God and the son of man. It's through heaven and on earth. And so our word for the book of Acts is authority. Jesus becomes and is our authority in what you're going to find out through the Holy Spirit. I love this picture. And, and so once Jesus says, I have the authority, look what he says in Matthew 28, verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, hang on here. Hang on here. When you understand the going, it's because you realize he has the authority and he's going to give it to you. But how does he give it to you? Well, in the book of Acts, he's going to show us. He's going to show us, I'm going to give you the authority because I'm going to bless you with the Holy Spirit. Whoa! Holy Spirit! You know, Pastor Gordy's going to teach. He might say, Holy Ghost, every once in a while. It is okay. Like the Holy Spirit, yes, has to come and empower us because Jesus wants to give us the authority to walk these things out. And the things that the Spirit of God gives us Sometimes it makes you uncomfortable. And I just want to tell you, on the book of Acts, we need the authority. We need the empowerment that can only come from him. And he says, I want you to go do these things. And oh, how long for Matthew 28, verse 20 he says, you're teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. We cannot stop walking out what started in the book of Acts. And you don't even understand, and I don't mean you personally, but like we don't understand the going part unless you understand you have the authority. Oh, I don't know what I'd say. I'm afraid of what I, I don't know what I would do. The reality is if you have the authority like he's empowered us with, you have nothing to fear. You guys know who, who, who uh, Acts was written to? Who it was written to? Yeah. Uh, I do not know. Who. In Acts 1-1, Kevin, let's go there today. I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, all about that Jesus began to do and teach. So he's writing to one person. And so Acts might not have even had a title, to be honest. And this could have been Luke 1, <laughs> Luke 2. I don't know. The point is, is this is who he's writing to in uh, the book of Acts. I write the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. What an awesome picture. So what you're going to see in the first 12 chapters, okay, in the first 12 chapters, you're going to see uh, predominantly it's going to be about the church and Peter. Okay? But then when you get into 13, verse 28, Kevin, do you have any, 
If, if you're to pick one character about who it would predominantly be about, you got any thoughts? Goes to Paul. Yeah, you got it, Paul. Church and Peter, and then it's going to transition into the Apostle Paul. Now, again, remember, a lot of people have said, is this the book of Acts of the Apostles? Is this the book of the Acts of the Holy Spirit? Yes. Now, if you run with the title of the Acts of the Holy Spirit, I want to read a quote here, okay, by MacArthur, and I like this. You know, the Acts of the Holy Spirit is directing, controlling, and empowering ministry that strengthened the church, okay, and caused it to grow in the, in the Holy Spirit in numbers, in power, and in influence. So the reason that the apostles are able to do the work is because you're going to see the Holy Spirit has come into the picture. I want to just kind of describe a little bit of, um, in fact, let's, I want to go three times. I want to talk about where Luke is described. Colossians 4, verse 14. He is what's considered the loved physician. Colossians 4, 14, Luke, the loved physician. And it says, and Demas greet you. But we know that he's a physician. So when it says a physician, he's actually a doctor, right? Okay, so this is one description. Go to 2 Timothy 4, 11. 2 Timothy 4, 11. Only Luke is with me. Uh, bring Mark with you, for he is useful to me in the ministry. So again, Luke is con constantly in, uh, in Paul's path. He's constantly around the people that he needs to be around in order to document all that took place in the Acts of the Apostles. Just one more. Uh, try Philemon 124, please. <laughs> Thanks. So here you have uh, the description of, of Paul's co-workers, right? Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my co-workers. What I love about Luke, how he's being described, he's a doctor, which probably means he's going to be very detailed. I'm going to guess type A even, right? I mean, kind of have this mentality, this heartbeat. He's one of Paul's close friends. He's a traveling companion. Uh, obviously, he's a personal physician. And in Luke 1, 1 through 4, what you're going to even find is, is that Luke is a very careful researcher. Okay. Many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us. In verse 2, just as the original eyewitness and servants of the word handed them down to us. Look how Luke is describing. It also seemed good to me since I've carefully investigated everything from the very first to write it to you in an orderly sequence, most honorable Theophilus, in verse 4, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. Luke interviewed, think about this, you guys. He interviewed Peter, he interviewed John, he interviewed others, a part of the Jerusalem church. You know, Paul was in prison for two, year, year, two years and Luke interviewed Philip and his daughters. Uh, you're going to find in the, in, the, in the Acts, you're going to see the we sections. I'll never forget in seminary when Luke starts describing we were a part of this, we were a part of this. And so just trying to give you an, an understanding of that he interviewed people, but there are seasons when he would say, yeah, but I was involved as well. And you're going to see that as it unfolds. And so just some of this language. And really, what I love what Warren Wearsby describes the book of Acts, he just, you know what he says about the book of Acts? This is what he says. How can we, how we can make our lives count? I like that understanding. How can we make our lives count? That's really what you're going to see in the book of Acts. And really, you take that, that spirit and you bring it to our lives today. How can we make our lives count? Count. Now, a couple things. Probably was written before the end of Paul's uh, first Roman imprisonment in 80, 60 through 62. When you get into the backdrop, okay, why is he writing? He's writing to give Theophilus a narrative of these things which Jesus did here on earth. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's what he's describing. Now, in this process, though, there, you're going to see this, this growth that began with Jesus' ascension, okay, the birth of Jesus on Pentecost and Paul's preaching in Rome. He's, he writes about the growth of the church. That's what you're going to see. The launch of the church takes place, and who gets to record it? Luke. <clears throat> like, to me, what an incredible opportunity to say, you know, I witnessed the most unique revival of all time. And Luke gets to write about it. The Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter. But what I do think, and I will just say, I'm not going to read this, but you don't even have to zoom in. But right here is all the growth chapters. <laughs> and then here's all the verses that are on the opposition. When you see growth, you should expect opposition. That's what we'll see in the book of Acts as well. Interesting enough, Theophilus actually means lover of, of God. And so here he is writing to a person who falls in love with God. 
Luke and Theophilus are friends. Crazy enough, uh, you know, in, as you get into uh, the historical side in Matthew 28, remember the authority that has been given, right, to each one of us through the Holy Spirit, you are seeing the initial response to the Great Commission. What you're seeing recorded in the book of Acts is truly an, a ridiculous act of obedience. By eventually, it'll be 12 guys that started off. We'll kind of walk through that process. And because of 12 guys not worrying about their life, uh, you and I stand here today. You and I actually get to hear about Jesus. And then guess what we get to do? We get to walk out the authority. We get to walk out what we have been given. Crazy enough, the book of Acts emphasizes that Jesus was the Jews or Israel's long-awaited Messiah. He truly becomes the hope of Israel in the book of Acts. And so here you have it. One thing I will tell you, there's multiple illustrations. I just want to give you an example. I'm not going to teach on it, but I want to give you an example. The use of the Old Testament in the book of Acts is through the roof. It's incredible how much Luke ties it in to everything that you and I have been teaching and studying and walking through. He ties us into, you know, Joel. He ties us into the Psalms. He ties us into Isaiah. Let's just use one for an example. Go to Acts 2.35. Again, you could literally pick multiple ones. All I'm going to do is just pick a verse. Acts 2.35. Until I make your enemies your footstool. Okay, so he just literally writes down a verse. Now, Kevin, if you would, go to Psalm 110, verse 1. All I want to just show you, just a simple illustration. The book of Acts is walking out. Now, look, in Psalm 110, 1 says, The Lord declared to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. You will see Luke tie in so many words from the Old Testament into the book of Acts. So just because we have a new set, just because it's in the new covenant, it doesn't mean we've completely wiped out the Old Testament. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 17, I have actually come to fulfill, not to abolish and not to destroy. And that's what we get to see in the book of Acts. We get to see more and more fulfillment of the Old Testament to the New Covenant. Kind of a fun way to look at it all. All right, can I just tell you this? Um, the book of Acts was my first assignment at Dallas Seminary. And uh, I had to take one of these verses. In fact, Acts 1.8, it's like the famous verse of, of all of the book of Acts. I mean, everybody just, if you want to teach on the Great Commission, you're going to tie in the book of Acts, Acts 1.8. And I'll never forget and I, I went into class and I had no formal teaching in, uh, in Bible training, Bible classes, you know. And yeah, I went to a Christian school, but I didn't have to take a lot of classes. And so I'm sitting down and he goes, all right, class, I need you to take Acts 1-8. And, and I need you to make 25 observations of this verse. It's like, what does that even mean? I, I really, I honestly, I, I, I want you to write down the things that you observe about this verse. And so I went home, I told Laura, I was so excited. I was like, yes. I observed 25 things and I literally, I remember I walked up and I was getting ready to hand in my paper and he goes, we don't want your paper. And I was like totally de defeated. I was like, well, that's dumb. Why did I do that if he's not even going to collect my assignment? I guess what I was thinking. That was my flesh. And he said, no, we want you to do 25 more. We want you to do a total of 50 observations for Acts 1-8. And I remember thinking, that's a dumb assignment. Because <laughs> I just remember thinking like, what are they thinking? And what it started teaching me, and this is why I want to apply this to you today, was guys, when you read the book of Acts, there's a lot to observe. We might not cover it all. I want you to slow down and soak in the word of God. Observe all that you can in such a way that it will cause you to walk this thing out. It changed my life actually, doing that study. It's the first time I started seeing uh, the Spirit of God speaking through me in what the Scripture is saying. Like, what does this look like? And sometimes you just got to slow down. And so when you hear through the book of Acts, you're like, man, I, I didn't, you didn't get to this part or you didn't cover that part. I, we didn't. There's so much here. But I want you to do it. Don't just depend upon me. Allow the Spirit of God, as it says in 1 John 2, to teach you to do this as well. That, that's our goal, you guys. Our goal is, is that you would be able, you ready for this one, to actually teach this to somebody else. And that's really what the book of Acts is, is that they become disciples who are making disciples who are making disciples. Revive School end goal is the book of Acts. It's for you to walk out what you just heard so somebody else could embrace 
the gospel. So Father God, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would begin to speak through this time, through this whole week, through uh, the book of the Acts, and that God, you would show us what do you want us to learn from. So bless this remaining time. And God, I pray that we get radically rocked. I pray that the Spirit of God is all over uh, this teaching and this, this, this reading in our own times and studying the study guide and reading Laura's words. I pray that the Spirit of God is all over this, that we're completely a different person because of the Word of God. You said in the Scriptures, Father, that you are, your Son is the source of life. And God, I'm asking that you reveal more of that to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, what you're going to see here, guys, in Acts 1.1. It's just fun to say that, isn't it? Acts 1.1, Luke says, I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Can you even just fathom even writing that? Oh, yeah, I got to witness, I got to witness it, and I'm writing about it. And then in verse 2, and so here's what I began to write about. Until the day that he was taken up, after he had given orders through the Holy Spirit to the apostles, he had chosen. Verse 3 says, after he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. All right. Did you catch all that? <laughs> Just in this alone. I mean, you're talking about the gospel here. So the reality is this. Christ in verse 3 says he suffered. OK, you know what that means? He died. OK, in this process of dying, being put on the cross, it says then he came back to life and he came back to life after he came back to life. Kevin, he showed up to them for how many days? 40 days. 40 days. So think about this, okay? In all of the gospels, he just kept saying, it's not yet time, it's not yet time, it's not yet time. And then guess what? He dies. It's time. And he's dead. Three days he comes back to life. And so he begins to present himself that, hey, I'm actually real. I'm actually alive. And so then he begins to show them through convincing proofs. He begins to appear to them at random times, speaking to them about the kingdom of God. And in verse four, it says, while he was together with them. During these 40 days, okay? So he's hanging out with Kevin, how many disciples right now? Realistically. 11. 11, why? Why 11, not 12? Because they haven't chose, well, Judas. Judas is gone. Right. So just make this simple, you guys. One of the things I have to tell you about the book of Acts, it's intimidating at times because it's so much. And you're like, where should we run with this? Slow down. Simplify it. He's with his disciples that he's been doing ministry with for three years. They saw him die. And now he's back to life. And he's saying, guys, this is all real. And he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem. Now, if I'm his disciples, I'm thinking, you're crazy. Because Kevin, where did they die? Where did, where did Jesus die? Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. So if they're killing the Messiah, and now, like, you want me to wait here? But it says, but wait for the farmer, father's, farmers. <laughs> wait for the father's promise. This, he said, is what you heard from me. He promised them to give the Holy Spirit. Kevin, can you go to Luke 11, verse 13? I want you to wait here. Man, we're so not going to get very far today. This is going to be great. <laughs> it's all right. Luke 11, 13. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Guys, let me ask you a question. In this context, in the Gospels, did they have the Holy Spirit? No. But in this context, guess what? He says, you wait in Jerusalem because the Spirit of God is going to come. Okay, do you remember? He, he promised me. Go to Luke 24, 49, Kevin, please. Luke 24, verse 49. Like if I'm the disciple and I'm hearing Jesus coming back to life, he's in front of me and he says, I need you to wait. And look in Luke 24, 49. He says, and look, I'm sending you what my father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you are empowered from on high. So the disciples are hearing a consistent message. Wait in Jerusalem until my father gives you what we're promising to give you. OK, now remember, we've even talked about Jesus being the promise keeper, right? Jesus keeps his promises. And what do you know? He's saying it again, because if you want to walk out the authority, you got to wait and receive it. It's a pretty cool picture here. He says, this is what you heard from me. It's like he's not making this up. In verse 6, it says, So when they had come together, 
They asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? Like for all they know, what? He's already come back to life. All right, let's go. Let's kick some butt. Let's, in, let's reinstate, right? Let's reinstate the Israeli political kingdom of God system. And Jesus, you become king. Let's go. And that's what they want. Let's usher in this deal. Like let's bring about the earthly form of the kingdom of Messiah. Like right now. Like, are you going to do this? This is what we went through. We know, in fact, they knew, interesting enough, and I love this, Ezekiel 36 and Joel 2 connected the coming of the kingdom with the outpouring of the Spirit. Okay, that was a lot there. <laughs> but they knew, okay, and I love, I, I really appreciate when MacArthur says this. I felt like he really tied this in well. They knew the Old Testament of the outpouring of the Spirit, and they knew that the coming of the Messiah, when he comes, like, here we go, we got our system in place. And that's what they're asking, Lord, are you going to, are you going to, is this it? Is this the time? Man, I would ask that question. Why not? My Messiah is back and he's in life and here we go. And in verse seven, he says, ah, it's not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. In other words, guys, we don't know the times. I know you want to know, but by the way, it's not yet. Because did you, did you forget? I commissioned you to go. So if I commissioned you to go, why would we start now? There's a whole lot more people that need to hear about the good news. So in verse eight, that's kind of the, uh, okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's what it comes down to. He's not going to do it right now. Okay, fine. What do we have to do now? He says in Acts 1.8, this is the verse that I had to do 50 observations and you could probably do some more than that. He says, here's what's going to happen. As you're, as you're waiting in Jerusalem, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses. What an awesome picture. In Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Man, I did a study um, on Jerusalem. I did a study on Judea and Samaria. I did a study on the ends of the earth and I could, I could camp out literally in each section. And all I want to just tell you is that word witness to me rocks my world. I want to write this out. That word written, that word uh, witness, okay? And you guys know I don't usually do the Greek mentality, but the Greek word, it means one who dies for his faith. You know what he's saying? when you actually believe my promise that the Spirit of God has come to give you power and authority, you'll actually die for me. For some reason, we think taking the good news is some business or some assignment through a Sunday school class. Here's the reality. If you're a follower of Christ, you've been asked, and are you willing to be a witness who will die for your faith in Christ wherever you're at? Like, would you do this in your Jerusalem? Would you do this in Judea? Would you do this in Samaria? Would you do this to the ends of the earth? And honestly, I think we just say, yeah, we have the power, but I don't want to do anything with it. It's the weirdest thing to me that we've been commissioned, we've been given the power, we've been given the authority, we've actually been told what to do. And we blatantly are saying, I don't, I don't really want to. Now I understand there's pockets of people, you might be one, we might be one, there might be people throughout the world that are doing this, but the reality is we're the only ones holding back the return of Christ. That's what I mean by this. Like we've been given an authority and a power that the Spirit of God has come upon us to walk out as representatives, as ambassadors for the living King. And we decide if we want to or we don't. I don't get that. And that's why it's weird to me when people say, well, the, Act, the book of Acts was back then. That's because we're afraid to walk out the authority that we've been given. This is real. Verse 9. 
It says after he said this, after Jesus said this, it says he was taken up as they were watching and a cloud took him out of their sight. <laughs> what? Jesus, I'd rather you stay here. I'd rather you implement the kingdom deal right now. He says, no, no, I got to leave so you can go do the work. We have been commissioned to go do the work of the Spirit of God. And you know what that means? It doesn't just mean making good meals. It doesn't mean just building homes or giving water. Those are all things of the Lord. But folks, we are to be a witness that actually releases the gospel, that releases the kingdom of God in the, into this atmosphere, into this earth. I really believe if we are actually walking out witnesses, he would have come back a whole lot earlier. We have an opportunity to walk out the authority. And what I love is, is that we have an incredible model that, so, that shows us how to do it. And so my prayer is that during Revive School, we would begin to embrace a different heartbeat for the Lord. Our feet would start itching and twitching and that we'd have to start walking this thing out, that we'd begin to extend our hands and releasing, yes, I believe, like the healing power that He wants us to walk out. I believe he wants to just to drop words of knowledge and wisdom that I believe only can come from the spirit of God. But it only happens when we say, I want to be a witness for you. Don't don't you dare box God in in this thing. When we do, we don't see this thing come to life. And I am so ready to Kennedy walk this thing out. So here you have these disciples. They literally see him going away and watch classic in verse 10. It says this it says while he was going like. He's still going, right? At that point, they were gazing into heaven and two men suddenly in white clothes, they stood by them. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven, he'll come in the same way that you've seen him going into heaven. And it says, then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. Can you imagine that conversation? Here they are walking, you know, roughly a half a mile because that would have been a Sabbath day journey. That would have been the farthest that they could have walked. Man, can you believe what happened? Jesus is up there. No, I don't. Where is he? But one of them somewhere in this whole process says, guys, Jesus told us to wait. He told us to wait here because we're going to be given the spirit of God. Why do we need to be given the spirit of God? So that we could be his witnesses. You know, I. The only reason I want to apologize is because we didn't even get to the upper room. <laughs> we didn't even come close to this. They ended up picking out, yes, they even ended up picking out a Matthias, uh, you know, another uh, disciple to add. They cast lots. And so now there's 12 in the picture. And here's at the point, at the end of Acts 1, they're waiting. What an awesome picture, you guys. They're waiting. And Kevin, what are they waiting on? They're waiting for the Holy Spirit to come and they're waiting for the Spirit of God to come so that they could be His witnesses. That's the book of the Acts. That's the Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of the Holy Spirit. It is God on the move through you. All right, guys, this is Acts 1, Lesson 1. Wow. We'll see what happens tomorrow. Bless you all. Have a great day.